you this slide where I outlined a roadway with two ditches, going back a few weeks now to remember, that our Lord is warning against the twin ditches of legalism on the one hand and lawlessness on the other with a Christ-centered righteousness that goes between, which is called lawfulness. And weeks ago, and I'll say it again, we talked about how he illustrated this so brilliantly and so perfectly with that famous parable, the story of the prodigal son. Where you have, on the one hand, the prodigal who goes away and wastes his father's wealth, who comes to his senses and returns, The younger son illustrates the error of lawlessness, a self-righteousness that says, I'm going to do it my way, now, on my timing. This turns out to be a way of death. He returns, his father receives him, but the parable is also about the older brother. The one who is invited into the banquet, celebrating the return of the younger brother, and he stands outside with arms crossed in bitterness and in anger. And though the father pleads with him to to leave his judgmental attitude and to enter into the feast of forgiveness, Jesus leaves him outside the room with a choice to make. Hopefully, with this parable, teaching all of us that we need a righteousness which comes from Christ. Not from our own, but from Christ. That actually leads to a fulfillment of righteousness as the Lord lives in and through us. But this, this story of the prodigal son also plays out to some degree in the, the story of the children of Israel, doesn't it? For we get in the book of Judges a story where the Bible says over and over and over again the people did what was right in their own eyes. Living the prodigal life, experiencing God's discipline even to the point of exile, their self-righteousness displayed by lawlessness. But by the time of Christ, they seem to have learned their lesson, but now you have a Jewish leadership that's a lot more like the elder brother in the prodigal son. Words for whom Jesus has, a group of people for whom Jesus has tough words The scribes and the Pharisees entrenched in judgmental legalism, full of self-righteousness that animates them to the point of murdering our Lord. But Christ in this sermon shows us his way, his path of righteousness. And we have learned about it and have been desiring to press into him to experience the, the sap that comes through the vine as we abide in him and produce much good fruit. And as we looked at the thesis statement of the Sermon on the Mount, and consider what the Lord is doing, you can see him giving us this way between. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I'm not talking about lawlessness at all. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I, for truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. We talk about how this refers to the moral law, how the Lord reiterates it. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But then he's going to say this. And every single one of his listeners is going to be like, oh man, what's he talking about? For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. These are the professional holy people. Everybody looks to them for for guidance to interpret the law, to be righteous, and Jesus is going to say, they're not righteous? What does that mean? And how are the Pharisees and the scribes going to hear that? Whoa, Jesus, what are you talking about here? Then he goes on after he shows this beautiful and high holiness, 
And people start to feel the despair of of that point of view. He says to them, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. That doesn't actually come immediately in that text, but in this sermon he's describing in the Beatitude what it looks like. What does it look like for someone who is thirsty for righteousness? As they press into Jesus, how will they be characterized? And he's constantly contrasting them with the scribes and the Pharisees. Amazing. It's a beautiful sermon. A beautiful sermon. And it can be tempting, especially in chapter 7, as you go through these sections, to think of them as a bunch of disjointed things. Like Jesus is going to talk about this right now. And then he's going to come over here and talk about this right now. And he's going to come over here and talk about this right now. And it's easy to think of them as like reading through the Proverbs. Are these just famous sayings from Jesus? What's going on here? I think that they definitely are coherent, that they have a middle. And he is expanding his theme in chapter 7. And so for our purposes this morning, I'm going to try to show you how they connect. And how they connect in our Lord. And it's going to be a little bit interesting for you. You're going to feel a little bit like you're on a merry-go-round. Because I'm going to preach the negative First, you know how the Christian life is to take off the old man, the things we ought not to do. And then we'll talk about the things that we ought to do, putting on the new man. And then I'll go through it all again in the, in the application round. So don't worry, it'll all fit. First, Christless righteousness. What does Christless righteousness look like? and sound, and behave like. Well, the first thing that you'll note, and we've been saying it already, is that it is self-righteous. It is self-righteous. Please look at your Bibles with me. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye, Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye. When there is a log in your own eye, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Self-righteousness here is expressed through a hypercritical, judgmental spirit. The Lord here is not teaching us that we are not to make judgments. In fact, he makes judgments all the time. The very next text is going to be making judgments. But he is confronting a self-righteousness that is hypercritical. One of my favorite preachers, a 20th century preacher from London, is named Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He was trained as a physician before he became a pastor. And like a doctor, he is very good at diagnosing, in this case, spiritual problems. I'm going to follow him for a little ways here as he describes what a hypercritical, self-righteous spirit looks and sounds like. Prepare yourselves. You might not like the doctor's diagnosis. I certainly don't. The Lord is describing here a self-righteous spirit, a feeling of superiority, and a feeling that we are all right while others are not. A feeling which leads to censoriousness. Now, that's a big word. What is censoriousness? It refers to a disapproving, disparaging, fault-finding, complaining attitude. And whether or not it's ever expressed in words, it's the inner life of the hypercritical, self-righteous person. This is a spirit that's always ready to express itself in a derogatory manner. And then a tendency to despise others and to regard them with contempt. He says there, are all, there is all the difference in the world be, be, between being critical and hypercritical. There is a true and good criticism that we need, but it's never destructive or merely deconstructive. It's constructive because at the bottom it has appreciation for the person. The hypercritical person enjoys criticism for its own sake, delights in it. They're Fault finders, they they pounce. It's cynical. It hopes for the worst. It delights in bad news because it is fundamentally motivated by envy. 
The hypercritical spirit expresses opinions on topics that are none of their business. And it tends to be highly biased, but ironically believes themselves to be the only objective person who are surrounded by biased idiots who are asleep. This person is hasty, doesn't listen well, rushes to snap judgments without getting the facts first, and they also impute other people with negative motives. They don't care about getting the whole story or other people's views or attenuating circumstances because why do they matter? A hypercritical person is eager to judge another person's character, not being content with merely looking at their words or their actions. This person is quick to speak, quick to become angry, harbors grudges and resentments, and ironically often feels judged and criticized by others even to the point of imagining that the people around them are just as critical as they are. So they may become paranoid and defensive as they project their inner life onto and into the people around them. So they're miserable, but they like it that way. Because they have sadistically redefined their own happiness as self-righteous negativity. But not only does self-reliance, sorry, does self-righteousness get expressed by a hypercritical spirit, it can also overcorrect, fly across the road, land in the ditch on the other side into a hypertolerance. You might feel yourself, after hearing that from Lloyd-Jones, experiencing the desire to jerk the wheel across the road into the other ditch. Oh, well, okay, I won't judge anything. And they... They give up their responsibility to make moral judgments, to rebuke their neighbor, to do church discipline. Because, I mean, after all, who am I to judge? But the Lord immediately tells us to make judgments. Look at Matthew 7, 6. He anticipates the ricochet. Do not give dogs what is, what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. How can you not... How can you follow this without making judgments? You have to know what a dog is. You have to know what is holy and what is not holy. You have to know what a pearl is. You have to know what the pigs are. You have to make judgments. We must make judgments. The Lord teaches us to make judgments. But not only is the person who is self-righteous, do they have this hyper-criticism and hyper-tolerance. They're also self-sufficient. There's no need to pray Pass, or sorry, the, the, our Lord goes immediately into a section on prayer. And it's helpful to notice how he keeps bringing people back to prayer. Because how are you going to have Christ-centered righteousness if you're not a person of prayer? Christless righteousness is prayerless because it's self-sufficient. Here the section on prayer. Beginning in verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you if his son asks him for bread will give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish will give him a serpent. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your father who is in heaven give good gifts. Give good things to those who ask him. He's done this before. There's no way you can be righteous on your own. There's no way you can make the judgments right on your own. You have to be hungry and seek and be thirsty for righteousness. You have to beg God for it in prayer, knowing that he is a heavenly father and he knows exactly what to give you. But not only is the Christless person self-righteous and self-sufficient, they're also just fundamentally selfish. They have a hard time with verse 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and prophets. They're selfish. It's hard to see the other person's point of view. But not only do they have this selfishness problem, this fundamentally selfish problem, this is also the standard of the world. This Christless righteousness is the standard of the world. The Lord says it's a broad way. Look at verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, 
For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. This is the way of the world. This is how they operate. Not only is this the standard of the world, we find that this Christless righteousness is lurking within, it's sneaking within, it's sneaking within not only our own hearts, but in the community of faith. And so the Lord will issue a warning about false prophets next in verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can the diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you'll recognize them by their fruits. Look how the Lord is saying you have to discern, you have to make judgments. Because this Christless righteousness lurks within our own hearts creates false teachers who can sneak even into the community of faith. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Tough words, particularly to the scribes and Pharisees who think that they are doing God's will. But this can happen. There's not only a danger of false prophets, but of false assurance. The, the Lord's disciples had a traitor even within their midst. One who said, Lord, Lord, who preached, who participated in the miracles. Judas is scary. But not only do we have this self-made righteousness sneaking within our hearts and in the community of faith, this, we find that this way of life is fundamentally unsound. It leads to disaster on judgment day, but it also doesn't hold up to the crises, the storms of life. Verse 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And anyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. It is unstable. It cannot withstand the trials of life. Then the chapter concludes with a note, verse 28, And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, shocked. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. You hear the contrast there. So, pretty negative list, isn't it? Pretty negative list. Let's look at it again, but now think, it, think about it from a more positive way as we consider what it means to have Christ-made righteousness that comes from the inner life that is animated by the Holy Spirit, what does that look like, friends? First, Christ-made righteousness loves justice and mercy, and it walks humbly with God, Micah 6, 8. Throughout this whole sermon, he's talking about what it means to love justice and mercy and walk humbly with Jesus himself. So if you struggle with a hypercritical spirit, we have to be able to love justice and mercy. And we're full of self-righteousness. We need the righteousness that comes from Christ that humbles us and turns us from judgmental, hyper-judgmental people or hyper-tolerant hyper people into people who beg God for righteousness in prayer, which is the next point. This person is thirsty is fervent in prayer. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock it and it will be opened to you. Remember he's taught us not only here but 
in, the, in this whole sermon how central prayer is to the Christian life. That's how we join to Christ. How his righteousness flows through us. He keeps reminding us we're praying to a father who knows and cares and loves us. Cares for our daily needs. Helps us to forgive one another. We're fervent in prayer. We ask for his will to be done on earth as it is, is in heaven. We ask. We knock. And the Lord says that he will open it and give. Not whatever you want, but according to his will. People that are full of Christ are fervent in prayer. Maybe you know a prayer warrior. Maybe you are a prayer warrior. Maybe you know what it's like to feel an ache in your soul that can only be soothed by begging God on your knees. Thirsty, fervent in prayer. And this person, as they are filled with the righteousness of Christ, are others focused, less selfish more desiring to fulfill the golden rule because they can see life from another's point of view, focused on others. It's also very countercultural, isn't it? Pilgrim's Progress talks about this narrow gate. A pilgrim goes, a Christian goes on his pilgrimage. Guys, the way of the world is a broad road, and it is forming us all the time. And so you should just spend some time, we all should ask ourselves, what are those things in our lives that are counter-formation? Those things in our lives that are swimming upstream to the greed and the lust and all the things that we've been talking about, how is it that we are being formed in a counter-cultural way, in this narrow way where it could be lonely and dangerous and hard, but with Christ. It is countercultural. We cannot be afraid of being weird. It's discerning. It's discerning. It can learn over time to prioritize the gospel and to be able to tell false teaching from pure teaching and also know how to tell true assurance from false assurance. We grow in discernment with our Lord, able to judge according to his righteousness, humbly. It's discerning. Finally, the result is this righteousness is secure in this life for the storms of life that assail us, but also gives, a, uh, uh, gives us a sure hope that we are with Christ in the future judgment. It's tremendous. So you're doing okay? That was round two. On your merry-go-round, we did one. Then we did another one. Now in the applications, we're just going to stick with the text again and go around a third time. But don't worry, we're going faster each time we spin the merry-go-round. What is the applications for us this morning? You're going to hear them again. You ready? Number one, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly. To do this as the Lord produces righteousness in us, as we pray for his will to be done, as he fills us with his word. Number two, be fervent in prayer. Ask, seek, knock. You know who you're praying to? To the heavenly father, with the elder brother, the son, by the Holy Spirit. We pray thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it needs to have some fervency to it. And maybe you're not feeling that this day. I know I go through cold and dry spells. Probably when I can't sense my need. But there's a fervency in, in prayer as we understand how desperate we are for Jesus and for his righteousness. Ask, seek, and knock. Storm the gates of heaven with your prayers. Third, live by the golden rule. Never goes out of style. It's always relevant. I can see, hear my at least on the weekly saying now, are you treating her the way you want to be treated? <laughs> With my kids. Are you treating him the way you want to be treated? And even now, sometimes when I'm up against a difficult question, pretty soon it doesn't take very long for my mind to think, okay, what does this look like from this person's perspective? I don't understand their actions. I don't understand their thoughts. What does it look like from their point of view? And if everything was turned around, how would I like to be treated if we just swapped places? 
It takes a lot of Christ-centered, prayerful work to see something from another's point of view. But people who are with Christ are humble, and they want to do that. They want to do that work with him. Live by the golden rule. Number four, enter through the narrow gate. It's likely that I'm talking to a lot of Christians this morning. People have walked with the Lord for, for decades. But maybe you're here and you've never given your heart to Christ. Or you say, actually, I think I'm kind of a pretender. I go through the motions, but I live a double life. Enter, my friends, by the narrow gate. The way to destruction is wide and easy. But Jesus is the narrow gate, isn't he? The gate for the sheep, the way, the truth, and the life. Join yourself with him by faith and walk his way. Enter through the narrow gate. And guess what? It's going to make you weird. Sorry. We have to be less afraid of not fitting in. Be weird in the best ways possible. Because if you follow Holy Scripture and as the culture gets perhaps increasingly dark or confused, you're going to be the one that has light and clarity. And it will hold up. But it will be lonely sometimes. You may feel like an outsider sometimes. That's okay. Enter through the narrow gate. Be weird. Five, beware of false prophets and false assurance. It's a problem then, it's a problem in every generation. And so we have to grow in our discernment to know what the main things are and what the things that don't matter are. Because when you get those flipped around, bad things happen. We have to be discerning so we can be aware of false prophets and false assurance. And finally, number six, build on the rock. Will you build on the rock? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Will you stand with him? He will give you a firm place to stand, and when the, the storms of life assail you, you will have a firm place to stand. The Apostle Paul, his life is so crazy. Shipwrecks and beatings, and he gets stoned, and he just keeps going <laughs> to the next place. Why? Because the righteousness of Christ, he wants to know it more than all things. It's burning within him. And gives him a firm and a solid place to stand. So you may go through terrible suffering, but you'll go through it with him. Build on the rock. Not only will this help you in this life, but you have a firm place to stand in judgment. Because you'll be in Christ with him. So to conclude, not only for today, but the whole series, I hope that you've been able to see how central and important the Ten Commandments are to all of the Bible. How our Lord, when he chose to preach, decide to comment on this type of righteousness. But how we've also learned how dangerous it is to try to manufacture that on our own instead of clinging to him and having him produce it in us and through us and with us. This takes prayer. This takes the community of faith corporately encouraging one another on pilgrimage as, as we go on pilgrimage together. I've had a tremendously enjoyable time going through this with you, and I hope that it has been challenging to you as well. Because if we're going to be perfect as he is perfect, we need a savior that's way bigger than us, don't we? Amen. So we will pray to him and ask him for these things. Lord, our Father in heaven, May your name be honored and lifted up and glorified above all things. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray you give us this day our daily bread. That you'd forgive us our trespasses and help us to forgive those who trespass against us. Will you protect us? Will you keep us from temptation and evil? Because yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We want to be with Jesus forever. It's in his name we pray, and by the Spirit, one God forevermore. Amen. Will you please stand as we respond in song?